The Orbis Etherum is the metaphysical plane containing all known existence. Within the Orbis are portals to worlds, pocket realms where life thrives, and where human beings live. The energy called Ether is omnipresent in the Orbis, so woven into life, so fundamentally necessary to this dimension and everything therein, that all living things are sustained by it, including humans who breathe ether, not air. Among these people are the Ethermancers, gifted with superhuman abilities. Ethermancy manifests in numerous ways, enhanced strength and speed, amazing cognition, shape-shifting, mental powers. But even those untouched by the gift of Ethermancy can affect the Orbis, and their influence, their impact, it can be profound. I'm Carlos, your storyteller. I will take you across the Orbis's history, delving into multiple tales, following multiple protagonists. As a result, we'll jump around the times, but always with purpose, I promise. This is a serial told in many interconnecting parts. I suggest jumping in here, but if you're the sort who needs to start at the beginning, by all means. Tales from the Orbis Etherum, Episode 21 Everyday Life at Orbis Edge, Part 7 Spark, Pyre, Inferno The Story So Far Parker Grace is the Orbis Edge Lighthouse's newest senior ether researcher, and has already made a huge impact unrooting deception and stopping a traitor among the station's soldiers. But that incident, and the captured traitor's maniacal, ambiguous ramblings of an encroaching threat, left Parker shaken. Haunted by nightmares of both the incident and her self-doubt, Parker heard news of unusual activity on Grand Lucian, her homeworld. Digging deeper, she discovered that multiple worlds were experiencing unusual geographical and political events. Events that Parker knew were no mere coincidence. With the lighthouse under indefinite lockdown and sick of doing nothing, Parker sought to speak to the imprisoned traitor, Onriel McLeod, about the vague, incoming menace. Parker gained Onreal's trust, learning of an entity Onreal calls Mother, someone who acted through her chosen children, sharing secrets of the Orbis with them. Parker learned a number of these secrets, many lining up with her own theories about the Orbis, and the implications worried her immensely. Eleven years ago, from the sheer cliff, one gets an amazing view of the mammoth Grand Lucian capital, Chalventi. Parker Grace's home. Parker Grace's prison. The fifteen-year-old girl stands at the cliff's edge, ironically not feeling faint or tired or cripplingly anxious. A sign, she feels, that what she's here to do is justified. Parker hates her life. Hates the drain, that horrible sickness that prevents her body from taking in enough ether, ensuring she'll always be tired, always be physically weak. Whatever disorder, and she knows it has to be yet another illness, keeps her feeling perpetual anxiety, well, that certainly doesn't help. Why couldn't she be born an Ethermancer? Born with the ability to command Ether to perform amazing feats. Hell, not even an Ethermancer. Why can't she just be... normal? What a glorious thing, normalcy. Maybe then... Her family, her friends, 
they wouldn't be so damn condescending all the time. So smothering, so protective. Maybe then, they'd actually entertain the notion to trust her. To let her leave this prison. It would be so easy to just jump. Dive headfirst into crushing oblivion. Into magnificent release. No, she, she doesn't want this. She doesn't want this. The wind blows past Parker, and she steps back. Right then, her face stern, a tiny flame ignites within, daring the Orbis itself to snuff it out. Present day, Orbis Edge Lighthouse. The military installation, cross-research station, cross-artificial world with a culture and identity all its own. It's a beacon of human ingenuity and thirst for knowledge at the edge of known existence. Within, important events have taken place that will affect the fate of the Orbis. Key players, some aboard, others on their way, are positioning themselves for the chaos to come. Some don't even know the role they're about to play. In a conference room in the R&D sector, a critical meeting is underway. At the table, Commander Raynum Altair, the man in charge of the lighthouse, opting to conduct this meeting away from his defense sector, no longer completely trusting his own soldiers. Silva Cruz, the sometimes eccentric, but always professional and loyal Lighthouse R&D lead. Lorne Malcolm, one of R&D's longest-serving researchers, literally a few days away from retirement. Donnelly Fargo, a research assistant who wonders why she's in such an important meeting with all the higher-ups. And Parker Grace who in her short time on the lighthouse has gone above and beyond a mere researcher's duties. Altair is puzzled by what Parker's been saying. What precisely do you mean by ether is alive? He asks. Exactly that, Parker says. It's something I and others have long theorized. She stands and taps buttons on a remote. A holographic map of the known Orbis Ethereum displays at the center of the table. There's a lot about the Orbis that, frankly, defies logic, Parker starts. Especially when we get into worlds and world systems. Think about it. Worlds all share a common day and night cycle. A 24-hour day, a 7-day week, a 52-week year, common timekeeping conventions... Common language, even. As Parker explains, the hologram highlights several worlds and their common traits. That's not even scraping the surface. Why exactly do worlds have suns? What even determines that daytime should be bright and nighttime dark, each lasting as long as they do specifically? You would think worlds and their systems would differ, based on their location in the Orbis, the customs of their indigenous peoples, but they don't. Not significantly enough to make any kind of sense. The hologram shows three world overviews. Dalarctica, Grand Lucian, and Valterra. Oh, there's some difference, like how Dalarctica's cooler than Grand Lucian. Yet even those differences, for the most part, seem... Fixed, staged, planned, at an incomprehensibly vast level. If I'm right, and if this mother McLeod spoke of is right, there's something governing existence. Something governing how everything, everywhere, works. 
The Living Ether, Lawrence states. Picked a good title for this book of yours, Parker. Probably dead on, too. Read what that Rula Claire guy wrote about Dark Etheramite? Spin a narrative out of it, and it suddenly clicks. Dark Etheramite is deliberate, an intentional creation of ether, either to keep us on our toes, or to fulfill some other purpose. Stands to reason that all ether works this way. Silva speaks next. Okay, okay, so this is all well and good. Crazy conspiracy theories about ether aside, what does this mean for the lighthouse? Crazy cult worshipping some nut job who's been reading academic papers about the Orbis, so what? Parker takes a breath before continuing. The incident, the one that Unreal messed with the records of. That's just the beginning. The hologram changes, showing a video feed of the Lucent Caverns on Grand Lucian. The scene is chaotic. There is, pardon my language, some serious shit happening, Parker says. Everywhere, virtually every world, things are going haywire in one way or another. For the next half hour, Parker lays out the situation. Every oddity, every unusual occurrence, every out-of-nowhere political move. Don't ask what this means for the lighthouse. Ask what it means for every person alive, Parker posits. Ask what it means for humankind. Because, insane as this is going to sound, ether, the very ether we're all breathing right now, I think it's at war. This mother... Dark Etheramite, whatever ravaged the world of Altera, they're all symptoms of something. And if Ether is alive, keeping things running smoothly for whatever reason it must, I think Ether is also keeping at bay something, someone, who would undo all creation. Donnelly chimes in. You have no idea what's coming. That's that's what Unreal screamed, right? And and the story you cooked up for her about unmaking the Orbis? She thought it was in line with what this mother has planned. So real nutty shot in the dark. What if mother is like a god? Like like a a demon god. At that, everyone in the room looks at Donnelly like she's the dumbest person alive. A demon god, the commander repeats. Donnelly shrinks in her seat, until Parker puts a hand on the woman's shoulder. I think Donnelly's dead on, Parker states. Everyone now gawks at Parker. It's a long shot, not terribly academic, but academia, honestly, doesn't always cut it. Especially not in this Orbis of ours, where we truly understand so little. But it fits together. Mother may well be an entity beyond our limited comprehension. And if she's trying to unmake the Orbis Etherum, Ether, Ether wants to stop her. And the incident, the projectile from beyond the wall... Might have been her, Altair finishes. We might just be stationed outside a... A demon god's... Prison. Later, at Parker's apartment, she pours Donnelly a drink. So why'd you want me in on that meeting? Donnelly asks before taking a sip. Because I trust you, Parker explains. And so does Raynum. Besides, you deserve to be there. You put it all together faster than the rest of the room. The two women drink and relax, as much as they can given everything that's happened. Station still on lockdown, Donnelly points out. What do you think the commander's next move is? Our next move. Parker laughs despite, well, everything. 
<laughs> what would you do, Donnelly? If there really is a demon god on the other side of the edge, and she breaks through, assume negotiation failed. Donnelly thinks on that a moment, then answers. Starts shooting at Mother and hopes some real talented ethermancers just happen to be aboard the station. That could work. Know what I do? Or rather, what I'm going to do? The flame within crackles, flares up, erupts into an unstoppable blaze. I'm going to beat Ethermancy to the punch, Parker vows. If Mother wants to end us, I'll end her first. That's it for this episode. If you like what you heard, and even if you didn't, drop me a line. My site is orbisetherum.com. That's O-R-B-I-S-A-E-T-H-E-R-U-M dot com. On social media, I'm at Orbisetherum on Twitter, and Orbisetherum on Google+, Facebook, and Tumblr. Holler, and I'll respond. I'm also on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and Pocket Casts. Just download your preferred app and search for Tales from the Orbis Ethereum. I slot right into your mobile device, uh, figuratively, figuratively. I had someone ask if I do actually insert into a mobile device, and uh, innuendo aside, I had to explain that, no, this is a figurative thing. If you enjoyed this podcast, consider leaving me a favorable review on iTunes. It helps me out. And hey, if you like, I use Auphonics online services to uh, regulate audio, to post-produce audio, I should say. Uh, if you want to donate me some Auphonic credits, the link is in this episode's description. This week's shout-out is at three TV shows that are pretty near and dear to my heart. Three so-called, quote, kids' shows, end quote. Steven Universe, Gravity Falls and Star versus the Forces of Evil. A lot of times, kids' shows, whether they're animated or not, are dismissed as being exactly that. And certainly there are there is children's programming that is entirely aimed at children, uh, educational programs, programs with very simplistic humor and very simplistic storytelling. But I never liked the label kids' show for something a lot grander than that label implies, especially if we're talking about Steven Universe, which I'm going to boldly claim is the best thing on television. And I am including uh, such shows such as Breaking Bad, uh, Better Call Saul, and some other big name live action TV dramas that you would think are more, quote, adult, end quote, which is not to crap on Breaking Bad or or Better Call Saul or any other TV show. They're they're great. They're fine. Uh, I have watched Felina, Breaking Bad's finale, like four times because I absolutely love that finale. But I'll talk about Breaking Bad another time. A show like Steven Universe and to a lesser extent Gravity Falls and to a lesser extent than even that Star vs. the Forces of Evil, though that one is getting up there. I bet in about a year... I won't be calling it second to anything except maybe Steven Universe. The, the, the thing about these shows is that they have such broad themes. They are not just for children. They are for adults. They are for teenagers. For anyone who wants to see fantastic storytelling. For anyone who wants to see positive female characters in fiction. Hey, I, I have a lot of female characters in Tales from the Orbis uh, because I'm so sick of every important character and everything being a man. But still, my characters don't touch... The Crystal Gems. They don't touch Mabel Pines. Hell, they don't touch Dipper Pines, for that matter. And uh, and and he's the male protagonist of a show that is otherwise great. Um, which isn't to say male protagonists are bad, but okay, I'm rambling a little bit. These shows are are fantastic, and and Steven Universe especially has so many lessons about about inclusivity, about uh, breaking gender norms and sexual norms. There are canon lesbian couples in Steven Universe. There is a canon transgender character, at least one. There, There's probably more. It is fantastic fiction and the best thing on TV right now. Thank you, as always, so, so much for listening. Until we meet again.